it's so nice to see you all here today. Um, yeah, I'm gonna... So the way the program is gonna go is we're gonna start with a little bit of a context and history of the CCP presented by me and Jim Ballinger. Then we're gonna learn about our first honoree, Tony Celentano, and he will receive his award. Then we're gonna have an interlude in the middle where we're gonna hear about publications of the center, both its history and some very exciting initiatives moving forward. Then we're gonna learn about our second honoree, Dr. John Schaefer, and he will receive his award. And then we're gonna have a reception in the lobby to follow. So let's get started. So my part is to do an illustrated timeline of the center. So this is like the CCP's baby book. So we're gonna start right, right back at the beginning. So this is a photo we use a lot, you may recognize. We've got Frederick Sommer, Ansel Adams, the center's first director, Harold Jones. We've got, oh, this says Beaumont New Hall. That's not Beaumont New Hall. It's, uh, it's Wynn Bullock and Harry Callahan. Sorry, that's, that's my typo in the, in the label. So this is at the center's opening in 1975, and the photo's by Ray Manley, for those of you who know Arizona history and Arizona highways history. I'm getting lots of nodding heads, yep. So the center was founded in 1975, but the story begins in 1974 when Dr. Schaefer, a very young university president, decided to invite Ansel Adams to have an exhibition here at the university. And I've heard him tell the story many times, and today I have the privilege of telling the story. So he talks about how young and naive he was about ways of donor relations. And so he, in, in the reception for the exhibition opening, approached Ansel Adams and said to him, what are your plans for your archive? Not realizing that really you're supposed to wine and dine and cultivate a donor for a decade before you ask a question like that. But Ansel Adams being the very straight up Western, you know, he's hails from California, was not at all offended, and said to Dr. Schaefer, well, the Bancroft uh, at Berkeley thinks they're gonna get my archive, but they're primarily interested in me as, as an environmentalist. If you wanna talk about putting my archive in the context of photography, then we should have a conversation about that. So Dr. Schaefer went to Ansel Adams' home in Carmel in December of 1974, they spent a week talking about what the center could be and what an institution like this would mean. And by May of 1975, the center was founded. So in that short time, they pulled together the five founding archives of the center. Ansel Adams was very close to Wynne Bullock. We have a Wynne Bullock exhibition on view in the galleries, which you can see after. Um, so their archives were two of those five founding. And Beaumont New Hall suggested that they reach out to Harold Jones at Light Gallery. And it was through Harold that the archives of Frederick Sommer, Harry Callahan, and Aaron Siskind also became part of those original five founding archives. We began with an exhibition at the University of Arizona Art Museum that included work by those five founding archive artists, as well as works from their personal collections, which also came into the center. So what we're seeing, I think I have a pointer. This is a Julia Margaret Cameron that came into the collection as part of that original gift. And then we have some nice variants of that famous view. Look at Harold in his seersucker suit, <laughs> right? How great is that? Here are Dr. Schaefer and Ansel Adams. <clears throat> and some of the, this is from the Daily Wildcat article on the right, and more of that press coverage. Right, isn't that wonderful? So our first location was at 845 North Park Avenue. And what we're looking at here is one of the very early shows in that space. Um, this is an O'Sullivan show, pictures from the Wheeler Survey, an album that Ansel Adams donated as part of his collection. Does anybody know who that is? Yeah, it's Peter McGill hanging an, an exhibition. He's a very fancy, very famous New York gallerist now. So one of our very early publications um, was published in 1976. So very early in our history, we began with publishing. So this is the first called Alfred Stieglitz, A Talk. 
And the journal, our journal at that time was called Center for Creative Photography. It was later renamed to the archive in 1981. Also in 1976 was the first year that we accessioned photographs into the collection. We acquired 5,000 photographs in 1976, including 1,378 which were purchased. In 1977, we moved to this location, a former bank building at 843 East University Boulevard. And I'm gonna show you some exhi uh, exhibition views of a Sonia Nascoviak exhibition. How many of you visited this space? Very nice. I'd say maybe a quarter. A case display. That's the, the Sonia Nascoviak copy of the Pepper. That's the number one of Pepper 30. So then in 1977, we launched our traveling exhibitions program with this show, Ansel Adams Photographs of the Southwest, 1928 to 1968, and Ansel Adams, A Survey. And this began at the University of Arizona Art Museum. There's Dr. Schaefer and Ansel. There's the announcement. I like that it says that there's a reception for Mr. Adams. You can probably recognize Moonrise there. And the gallery was adorned with cacti. So then in 1978, we acquired the W. Eugene Smith archive. In 1979, we loaned over 100 photographs to various institutions, including the Whitney Museum of American Art, and the LA Center for Photographic Studies. In 1981, we acquired the Ed Edward Weston archive. You're seeing a handwritten page from the daybooks on the right-hand side. In 1983, we acquired the Gary Winogrand archive. On the right, you're seeing an enlargement from the contact sheet. 1985, we acquired the Louise Dahl Wolf archive. So here on the right, you're seeing Louise Dahl Wolf at the camera. That's Deanna Vreeland styling the model. And that's for the shoot that produced this cover. Then in 1989, we opened the John P. Schaefer building at 1030 North Olive Road, a 55,000 square foot facility in which you sit. This is at the groundbreaking. So this is the parking lot that was here before this building was here. You'll notice this beautiful view we have to the mountains without that architecture building in the way. <laughs> Sorry, Brooks. <laughs> so here we are at the, at the ribbon cutting, our beautiful building. A couple of views of the lobby at different moments. I noticed Linda Connor right there. Does anybody know who this is? is it? That's right, it's Paul Roth giving a tour of the vault when the building opened in February of 1989. He's now the director of the Ryerson Imaging Center in Toronto, Canada. This is what our study room, print study room, used to look like. There's some of our staff. It's outside the staff lounge up on the roof. Then in uh, 1990, we opened the research center. So this is our original space up on the third floor where researchers would go to see um, materials from the archival collection. In uh, 1991, we established the Ansel Adams Research Fellowship to uh, to support the scholarly study of the collection. And then in, and so this is a list of all the scholars who've received the fellowship over the years. In more recent years, we've added additional funds to create other kinds of fellowships to allow uh, research in particular areas of the collection. But the Ansel Adams Fellowship is nice in that it's very broad and we can invite people, no matter what topic they're studying, to, to come and visit the collection. 
Then in 1992, John Sherkovsky was named the first Ansel and Virginia Adams Distinguished Scholar in Residence. And so what we're seeing here is a portrait of John Sherkovsky by Koza Miyoshi. And then a series of portraits uh, by Robin Stutenberg McDaniels, both made during uh, John Sherkovsky's time in Tucson in, in 1992. In 1995, Robert Heineken taught a seminar for graduate students here at the University of Arizona. I didn't have a picture of the seminar, but I like those portraits. In 2000, we received a preservation grant from the NEA to continue conserving the Edward Weston archive and to mount this exhibition, Edward Weston, A Vision Conserved. The exhibition took place in July of 2003 and ran through October of 2003. And so these are the first installation views we're seeing of exhibitions in this building. And for those of you who came to early exhibitions here, you remember we had a series of movable walls so what we're seeing here is one of those movable wall panels. Case display with a negative imprint of Keras. And here you're seeing the negative illuminated next to the print. Some conservation tools featured in a case. And then that case seen in situ. Uh, then in 2001, we organized the Gary Winogrand Game of Photography Symposium and exhibitions part one, The Known, which you're seeing here. And there again are those movable wall panels. And part two, The New. And the way it worked was the symposium happened over a weekend. And so when the symposium uh, participants arrived, the first show was on the walls. And at the end of that day, the prep crew deinstalled the entire first show and overnight installed the second show. So when the conference participants came back the second day, there was a totally new show in the gallery space. This is, this is the thing of legend around the CCP. And not something anyone wants to repeat again. It was quite a task. So here are some more images from the, the new part of the exhibition. In 2002, we received a Henry Luce Foundation grant to publish the Collection Guide Original Sources, Art and Archives at the Center for Creative Photography. That publication in 2002 was the last collections guide that the center has done. Um, I, I jumped ahead a slide, but in 2005, we were awarded a Save America's Treasures grant from the National Park Service to preserve the Ansel Adams archive. And then in 2006, we began a collaboration with Phoenix Art Museum. Including the inauguration of a 2,500 square foot gallery space dedicated to the Center for Creative Photography called the Doris and John Norton Gallery for the Center for Creative Photography, which we see in the top half of this view. And hopefully most of you have been and seen our exhibitions at the Phoenix Art Museum. In 2007, we acquired the Rosalind Solomon Archive, bringing the number of research archives and collections to over 200. Also in 2007, we expanded the print study room to its current uh, size. So there it is from one side, and here it is looking back into the print study room. Then in 2010, the Arthur J. Bell Endowment was created, allowing for the first staff conservator to be hired and funding a new conservation program. And these are some pictures of the lab. Um, also in 2011, we. In 2011, we created a second floor Volkerding Study Center. So you saw that picture of the little study room up on the third floor. In 2011, we created a second floor room where researchers could come and see both archival objects and fine prints together in one location. Also in 2011 was the first of the center's conversations. It was called the October Conversation and brought together uh, scholars, collectors, photographers, gallerists, conservators, curators, 
and created a, an environment for dialogue between all the different facets of our discipline. So the first one happened in 2011. The second one happened in February of 2014. This is the group portrait from that event. And then earlier this year, we had our first Ansel Adams birthday celebration, which brought over 600 people to the CCP on a rainy afternoon for cake. Uh, we had a lecture. We had uh, a tour of Ansel Adams archive objects by our archivist, Leslie Squires. And we also had an incredible display of all kinds of camera equipment for our visitors, um, courtesy of the Western Photographic Historical Society including this view camera. So here I'm looking out towards the front of the lobby. And of course, it's upside down in the ground glass. And then <clears throat> in 2018, the center is very proud to be welcoming our new director, Anne Breckenridge Barrett. And she's going to launch us into our, our next chapter. So with that, I would like to invite Jim Ballinger to come up and talk a little bit more about the center from his perspective. Jim. Becky, thank you, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Looking at those slides like a walk down memory lane, I think I made all of the openings of the buildings. Uh, so the affiliation between, my, I guess, myself and the Phoenix Art Museum and the center has been a long one. Uh, before I even came to Phoenix in 1974, I was a colleague of James Enyart, who was a longtime director here. So most of my photography interests stem from that. My guess is that when John Schaefer and Ansel came together and had this idea, they had a really big idea about what the center could do. And Becky's just shared that with you, of seeing internally how everything goes uh, and all of the wonderful exhibitions, publications, and people who have come here. But I think a really important thing to understand, which I'm sure has gone beyond even the vision of what those two great men had at that moment a real visionary idea is outside the whether it's the phoenix connection the national collection connection and international connections in my years as director of an art museum and being around the world almost any colleague i ran into was aware of the center for creative photography and i think many of us in arizona may take a place like this for granted it's always been at the university, these great collections are here, they're shared and we see them, but sometimes it takes those kind of outside experiences to make us realize what an incredible um, asset that we, that we have here. Uh, the other thing that happens with an institution that comes together that has this kind of impact is a vision, and it is a vision between two people from my, uh, at, at the, that initial spark of whether it was uh, Dr. Schaefer's naivete in fundraising and something tells me there's a bigger story there. Um, but, uh, or, and, and the timing to be right, and the timing, that, who would have guessed that you'd have a president of a university uh, who is also an accomplished photographer, who then can commit and see to an to a uh, institution like this that then has the stick to itiveness most university presidents, in my experience, would have opened this and gone on to the next thing, not stuck with it and, and made sure that it stayed, stayed true to their vision, which John has done so even since his retirement as president. And I've known him as a board member of the Tucson Museum of Art. I've heard colleagues say to me, oh, I met John Schaefer some, somewhere around the country, and he's espousing the center. So to have that kind of stick to itiveness and vision from a university president over a long period of years, given what the role of a university president is, I think is a, uh, is a real gift to this community. And it's terrific that you're honoring him here uh, today. So uh, when we saw what was happening at the center, and I think this can give you a, a sense of how important this was, Phoenix Art Museum had started, I'll call a fledgling photography collection uh, in, this, in the 1960s and 70s. 
And it became apparent really fast how successful this was going to be. When Harold showed up, the archives came together. Uh, so we decided that we would never collect photography and compete down with Tucson. We actually transferred our collection here at that time uh, and said, you know, we'll just work together on photography for the state of Arizona. So you realize that um, institutions work together, we see what's going on, and I think to see that nurtured through, it just culminated in 2006 with the idea when we were expanding the Phoenix Art Museum, photography had taken off. Again, go back to when this place opened, when Ansel was here and John, they were thinking about this, photography in an art museum? I almost got thrown out of graduate school because I was president of the Friends of Photography, or Friends of Art, Student Friends of Art at the University of Kansas. We had one of these things where you pick a work of art. We decided to buy uh, a Smith photograph for the University Art Museum collection. The, the art history faculty blew a gasket. And that's the very same moment that all the germination of this is coming about. So you realize what's happening, and then throw in digital technology and digital photography, if that's the right term, and you realize that there's no way, even with the energy that was here to start with, we'd have realized the power of photography, the power of image making in society today as we speak. So the role of the center is something that's going to be very, very important as we move forward. Um, so I just uh, am a really honored to be here to share a couple of uh, moments and basically say congratulations uh, to John Schaefer, to Tony, Becky, all the people in this room that have had to do any institution is made up of a lot of people and a lot of energy. And it's really, really important that this place be nurtured uh, and grow for this state, for this university, and what it can mean. And everybody here should be a member. Thank you. <laughs>